Picture this. You're in the garage, hands covered in grease. Just finished tuning up your engine with a part you found on eBay. And then you realize, you know what? I could also use new brakes. So where do you go next? Back to eBay. You can find anything there. It's unreal. Wipers, headlights, even cold air intakes. It's all there. And you've got eBay guaranteed fit. You order a part and if it doesn't fit, send it back. Simple as that. Look, DIY fixes can be major. Doesn't matter if it's just maintenance or a major mod. You got it. Especially when things are guaranteed to fit. So, when you dive into your next car project, start with eBay. All the parts you need at prices you love. Guaranteed to fit every time. eBay. Things people love. This is a particularly special episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast because today, folks, we have a man who leads a team that has brought the following drivers into Formula 1. Hear me out. This might be a slightly long list. Here are the drivers who have raced for Prema, who have then gone on to get in Formula 1. Esteban Ocon, Charles Leclerc, Kimi Antonelli, Lance Stroll, Pierre Gasly, Mick Schumacher, Oscar Piastri, now Oliver Behrman, Shou Guan Yu, Nick DeVries, Logan Sargent, Enzo Fittipaldi, Jack Doohan. We have Robert Kubica, Lucas DeGrassi, Kami Kobayashi, Robert Roberta Mary, Antonio Giovinazzi, Nicholas Latifi, and in the past, Valtteri Bottas too. It's, a, it's quite a list to have. And the man who's been running the team is right here with us. Ladies and gentlemen, we have René Rosin, the manager of the Prima Racing Outfit, not just in Formula 2, but overall, including their IndyCar outfit as well, is here with us. And René... What a pleasure it is to have you on. But I want to very firstly ask you about that list. That That's a good list of drivers that have come in from your team. Yeah, that's for sure. It's first of all, good morning, everybody. And I say good morning because I'm here in Indianapolis at the moment. So my time is uh, is quite early in the morning. It's, yes, but yeah, you say just quite a lot of drivers that have been passing through us. Quite good memory came out in our minds from all the success, all the moments. All the all the victories that we had done with all of them, and is a is a real pleasure and a real uh, moment of um, how can I say to be proud of to see all these drivers arriving in Formula One, but not only in Formula One, all in all other, all the other professional category that uh, that there are in motorsport. I I really want to ask you guys, uh, I mean just just to ask you, Rene, about the aim and vision of you guys at Prima. Is it largely just to develop these drivers? Because if it is, that that is such a great list of drivers you've put into Formula 1. And I'm not, I'm not even counting the other drivers who have done really good outside of F1 too. But to be honest, our goal, of course, is to do our job in the best way as possible. Giving to drivers the max of our professionalism, trying to give to drivers the best knowledge that we can give it to them, making them learning into their, um, their years with us. Of course, we are a junior team, so we are a team participating in all the ladder of motorsports that is coming from karting, moving into all the other category up to Formula One. <clears throat> Sorry. So our job is, of course, to be to give them all the instrument to be ready year by year to be one day in Formula One or to be one day professional. Because, of course, we must remember in motorsport, we don't need to focus only on Formula One. For sure, Formula One is the most important pinnacle of motorsport, but there is also other categories, other situations that not everybody can go to Formula One. So they can open doors in the professionalism world of motorsport, that can be also very, very important. But do you know, Rene, Prema, if it was in Hindi, the language we speak here in India, it would roughly translate to love. And that's the kind of really crazy coincidence that I come across. And I've always been thinking about this. The love is what really makes it work, right? Because you have so many drivers who are putting in so much into the sport and then you're able to give them such a great package all the time. I really want to bring it back to the start. Where did the Prem as in Hindi, we say love. Where did the love for racing begin in the family? How did the team come about initially? So everything started in uh, on my dad's mind. Uh, my dad's after school was uh, working in a, 
in an important Italian team back at the time uh, on the on the 70s. And he wanted to build up something by himself. At that time in Italy, the self-entrepreneurship uh, was something very, very important. And he decided together with uh, a person that ring on his bell on the door. There is a nice story on Facebook about uh, this gentleman that together with my dad founded the team. It's quite nice. And uh, to be honest, from there, everything started. They, they, they started in Prema in 83 with the goal of become an Italian team running in uh, an Italian Formula 3. Of course, the first year was not that possible because they started quite late and they start on uh, giving service to a sport prototype uh, car. After that, of course, already in 84, they move into Formula 3 with one car team and they achieve already a great result being P3 in the championship. So, <clears throat> sorry. So that's from where everything is started. At the time, they were my dad, his partner, that was also the sporting director, Giorgio Piccolo, my mom, that was uh, the uh, following a bit the accountant stuff, and my dad cousin, who was a mechanic. So everything started really on a familiar way. Of course, through the year, it multiplies and uh, become now on what we are today, that between all the operation within Europe and now also America, we are more than 200 people. So we need something that we need to be proud of, of course, in our job. But my dad started everything, like having a dream, having a, having a vision, and that's where we are today. That's insane. And 200 people is such a crazy number. That, that from where you guys started. I know pretty well. It's, I it's... know pretty well. <laughs> But it's so insane, right? I've, I've heard so many stories of small family teams in Italy, like Grazzini in MotoGP is one such example. Now, uh, we get to experience that with you folks as well. How has it grown? How, how fast has it been? Because in the last few years, you guys have gone from just Formula 2, Formula 3, and of course, the Italian F4 Championship and the likes, to karting, now IndyCar, sports cars as well, separately. It's, it's really expanding very fast. So, yes, it's expanding very fast, but we are expanding always in a way that will give us a bit of, st of stability and um, I would say, uh, first, when we do a step, we need always to be sure that we're doing the right step and in the right moment. We will not rush to do two steps in one time because otherwise you start to put in danger all what you had done before. So this is something for us very, very important. We need to solidify put the, um, the base, the basement on what we are doing, and then we do another floor on the building that we are growing up. Having said that, it's true, the big, uh, the big expansion has been started, I would say, with the Formula 2 Championship. At that time, it was GP2 in 2015. Before that, we, we did something, a part Formula 4 and a part Formula 3 for a while in the late 2000. But then, uh, of course, we stepped back because the economical situation, some difficulties happening. So we decided to reorganize ourselves. But then when in 2000, after 2012, we started thinking that is the time now um, after a good technical structuring that we had done, we started moving up what was the next step to be done. So to become a leader in the market, we need to be on the Formula One platform. So that's why in 2015, together with my that time partner, we decided to get into GP2. 2016 was the first year on GP2. Then, uh, of course, we are there since that time. After having won on the year one with Pierre Gasly and Antonio Giovinazzi, we did one and two and we won the team championship. On 2019, the Formula 3 merged together with GP3, moving into the Formula 1 platform, which is for us was a plus on it. Of course, we are all part of the old Formula 3, and we all know that the old Formula 3 was a great car, a great championship, a great adventure, uh, freedom of technical, uh, freedom of, uh, of development. But at the end, they were not anymore the time, because we need also to remember that our goal is to prepare drivers to go to Formula One. And our goal is, was not at that time to spend millions on development that doesn't give anything to drivers, a part of growing up engineers. For sure, we need to be remembered that we are a school, not only for drivers, but as well for mechanics and engineers. And this is one of, of the clear factors why brought us to go in so, into different categories, like for example, IndyCar, because we are, we create a ladder not only for our own drivers, but as well a ladder for all, all our people working with Prema. But apart saying that, the move to 
uh, merged the two championships was, of course, something very important because they were not market for such a big number of cars, 30 championship on one side, 30 champion on the other side. And, and there where we are at the moment. So the, the growing up of the team has always been done in a way that first we need to uh, stabilize what happened before and then was the moment to do another step and not never doing two step by hand because of course one of the key goals for us if we start in losing performance in one of the core business on the, the one of the core categories we have then everything will start in collapsing because unfortunately to say motorsport has a short memory so if one year you're not performing very well even if you have the best engineers, the best mechanics or the best drivers, then it will be difficult the year after. But having said that, once we do something bigger, we want always to be sure that what we have done up to that time is always been done in the correct way. I like how, you know, you've explained the philosophy of how we all have built Prema all over the years. And Rene, of course, I've, you know, been in touch with your team for several junior drivers that we've worked with in the past as well. The the one thing that always stood out for me, which is the most beautiful thing about Prema, was, you know, this high promotion ratio of drivers who raced for Prema ended up being drivers who ended up racing for racing in Formula One as well. And there's there was usually this thing that if you want to give yourself the best shot to a title, you have to race with Prema. So you of course are not guaranteed a win. As a driver, you still have to perform. But Prema was just better prepared than everyone else. So, so the question to you here is, how how is Prema so successful across different racing categories? Because, you know, Formula 4, you all are champions. Formula 3, you all have been champions. Formula 2, you all have been champions. Karting, you all have, you know, picked up several accolades as well. So not only have you, you know, spread your wings and, you know, gone deep into motorsport, you'll have actually built something so successful as as a business. So what makes you guys so successful? So first of all, I think one of the strong points that everybody's working for one goal. And this one goal is, of course, performance and result. We are not doing that for sure. We are a business because we are a company running and we need to make um, income. We need to make profit out of it. But most of the time, we are always looking at performance. What brings us to have the best performance? What brings us to get the best out of our drivers? Having said that, of, of course, the other great point, I would say in Prema, is that we are not there. And then once the, the day is finished, everybody disconnects and so on. We are like, really, we still to keep, we, we want to keep the familiar environment. We want to keep the friendship environment between all the people within the team and especially with drivers to give them this extra bit that can make the difference in the difficult moment. Because if in a difficult moment, a driver's feel that is welcome within the team there is a jokes there is a moment to laugh there is a moment of course to work but that can give to the drivers these extra bits of uh, 20 30 percent of uh, performance that can make the big difference so on the other hand we are really much data driven we are really much into performance but of course this is part of our job but we want to combine the moment to having fun at the moment to work together and mostly is never the drivers that can win alone. It's never the team who can win alone because even if you are the best mechanics, the best engineers, the best drivers, it's important that everybody needs to work as one team. And this has always been our goal since my dad started back in 83. On that, Rene, there's one really interesting thing about your team. Whenever a young driver has to start out their journey, if you are going with Prema, you do everything. Every F4 championship, you do Freca. You do F3 and then F2. It's not like you pick drivers from the middle of the pipeline, which other teams, of course, have to do. You, you have to get people in in any way you can. But why do you approach it in this particular way? Why do you want drivers right from the start and right from not just, let's say, UAE F4, but also Italian and then Freca and, and then the whole lot? What's the thought behind that? So this is, I think, some of the input that I wanted to put within the team in, in terms of business view. The business view that we want to grow up our drivers within our ladder. So, of course, there is a sort of selection because it's normal. You pass from six car in uh, Formula 4 
to pass to four cars in uh, in Freca if you consider three for the male drivers and one for the female. Then you step into Formula 3, you have a three cars only. You step into Formula 2, you have two cars only. So there is a selection through the ladder, which is quite normal. But on the other hand, we want always to try to pick up early the drivers working with us, getting them used to our way of working, getting them used to our environment and bringing them to us when it's possible, of course, because not all the time is possible, but most of the time is possible and that can bring result. And that's why we are really into all the ladder categories. We are, I think, the only team starting from karting, bringing drivers into Formula One, into up to Formula One. And now with expansion in Indy, we can bring drivers from being 10, 12 years old, to up the moment to be professional, either in Formula One or either in another category. The, the interesting part here is that Prema is participating in what we would call a spec series. You know, there is a single spec. And I've always wondered, like, you know, Prema is always, the, the legend has always been Yola, like the Ferrari of junior racing. Okay, the most popular, the most passionate team, of course, Italian as well. And uh, uh, I like how it rubs off on everything we do, whether it's kind of communicating with you or with Angelina and the likes. There's always so much intensity and passion there. But in a spec series, how does a team make a difference? You know, there is little room for maneuvering typically, right? Because you're given all the stuff from the championship. What's the Prema edge and how does Prema sort of make that difference? So is um let's say is a legend that you don't have a room of improvement because of course the car is fixed the car you don't have uh, you have a uh, certain uh, items that you can work on it but is if you start inputting cool, uh, the details uh, the cool of the details in the max way as possible the trying to achieve every single bit looking of every single bit and on top of it putting as well the passion the the um, the human aspect into the type of work you are doing because even if you are a spec if you the drivers trust you 100 percent if the the drivers and engineer relationship is really bonding each other you can get out of the drivers even much more performance even if sometimes maybe the car is not the best out but you can 100 percent uh, extract from the drivers a result that's n- never before you can de- do so this is of course something very very important for us of course uh, is the quality of material you're putting so you trying not to go in over certain time limit in terms of life in but of course this is a mix of factors that can make the difference in, uh, in spec series and a lot of it i suppose must be down to operations right picking the right people getting the right engineers the right mechanics just how big is that set up for you you mentioned 200 people across the group for instance in a formula 2 team how many people do you have what's the structure like so first of all uh, this sport like uh, everything is a question of men is a question of human is a question of people working together so fundamental is to be able to working together and even if you are the best engineer or the best mechanics but you're not able to cooperate within your colleague, within your mates, you cannot achieve anything. So this is for us the first point when we choose somebody. is the first point in the term of selection of the person because need to be able to work in a group. You're not fighting just for yourself, but you're working and representing a brand, which is Prema, and you need to work for Prema. And with Prema, you need to go and winning races. So having said that, in Formula 2, by regulation, we are 11 people. And... Um, Having on top of it, of course, team principal is out of the operational way. So we are quite limited, and that's why we need to spread a bit the role. For example, our technical director, that up to before was just doing race engineer and technical director, now is also team manager, because that's what regulation brings us to do. But having said that, is is quite limited and is quite time demanding. But of course, on this case, promoter and federation, they're trying to do everything as possible to try to limit the the over hour, the overwork that you can do, especially in, in race weekend. But uh, and in these years, it's getting better and better. Of course, we don't have curfew like Formula One that at a certain time they go home and they go in uh, relaxing in the hotel. <laughs> in our case, we have longer hour because, of course, we are less people working, but it's getting better and better. Sticking Sticking to that interesting comparison you made about Formula One, I would love to also use this opportunity with you to simplify Formula 2, right? So 
What's a Formula 2 team's infrastructure like, you know, in terms of workshops, factories? And of course, you know, do all the teams have similar infrastructure? Because I know there are regulations on how many people work on the car. But what's what's it like with Prema on the infrastructure side? So in terms of infrastructures, at the moment we have, uh, our base has been remaining the same since 1997. So we bought this building in 1997, and then at that time we were doing, I think, if I remember well, I was just 16 at the time, but we were doing uh, three Formula 3 cars and uh, two Formula 3000, so five cars in total. Now inside the factory, we have uh, 16 cars. (laughs) <laughs> I would say. And uh, so we cannot put any more the trailers inside, but the, we each car has its own uh, bay. Each car has its own equipment dedicated to the car. It's split it between categories. So we have an area dedicated to Formula 3, an area dedicated to Formula 2, an area dedicated to Regional and Formula 4. And of course, uh, we have when the Academy, the Formula 1 Academy cars are back because they're traveling all the time in freight, during the characteristic of the championship, then we have a dedicated area for them. Of course, due the time and the expansion and the space needed, instead of buying a new facilities, we just aggregate different location all connecting together because we have been able to find few location um, on the neighborhood. So there we build up the simulator, there we build up extra offices, there we build up the space for the endurance. And uh, and of course, this is how everything started. We started from a small area and then uh, grow up now in, in quite a big structures. Of course, in the ideal world, you need to do a new building and so on, but the investment needed is way too much. And of course, we are okay where we are. is uh, is a perfect solution at the moment and uh, and we are is I think is most important functional. We don't need to be looking uh, just great. We need to perform on track. So this is another point. I'm not, I don't, uh, I, I don't care to be the best track or the best looking uh, um, from outside. Uh, what I want that I'm okay on performance. Sorry, I'm okay on presentation because it's quite a vital point for us as well. We are always looking great from uh, from the outside, but on top, we want to concentrate really on performance. So that's what we're always doing. Of course, the red and white and tinges of yellow are always the most striking race cars on the track. Uh, but, you know, the, the interesting thing, I like how you explained how you went from three to 16 cars now. Uh, I think the biggest step you all have made even more is the IndyCar operations. You all allow, announced Robert Schwartzman recently. But could Formula One be that ultimate dream one day? Listen, I will not, uh, I cannot deny it. Formula One is a dream for everybody. Formula One is a dream for me as management, is a dream for my dad as founder of the team. Actually, in an interview he made for the 40th anniversary of Prema, he say the journalist Roberto Kinkero, the Italian presenter of Sky Italia for Formula One, say, how do you see Prema in 10 years? And my dad say, why not in Formula One? Mm. A part of the joke, of course, Formula One is the dream of everybody. It's a dream of every mechanics working in Prima. It's a dream of every engineers because, of course, they're doing this job because they aspire to go to Formula One. But to go to Formula One, you need to have the right condition, both economical, supporting, and so on. So at the moment, it's not the time. We will see what the future will bring. We need to keep the door open, the eyes open, but we need to concentrate on what we are doing at the moment. We have quite a lot in our plate. We have quite a lot to digest and uh, and perform so i think that's what we need to look forward wait something tells me you have thought about it though you have evaluated the idea of going there haven't you to but, listen need to be evaluated <laughs> all the time that there is a possibility but having said that at the moment we are concentrate where we are we of course we need to look into the market i don't say that uh, is my, is a dream for everybody to be in formula one because it's the pinnacle of motorsport, it's the most professional category. But of course, you need to, to arrive in another dimension. You need to arrive in a totally different uh, environment. Uh, it's not anymore junior formula. It's not anymore what we are doing at the moment. Is 800, 900, 1,000 people working, and it's totally different. So let's uh, get step by step in, in the case in the future. In the case the future will bring us that, of course, we need to be ready and to evaluate all the opportunities. I would love for the Ferrari of junior racing 
to enter Formula One and go head to head with the Ferrari of Formula One. And you know, there aren't enough Italian teams in in Formula One with all the intensity and passion you all bring. And I personally love that Italian anthem. So having you all race there will just raise the chances of listening to that. Honestly, I would like to listen my (laughs) anthems much more for much more time in Formula One. They have the (laughs) anthems also for the teams, and I would like to listen also for the teams in in the junior formula. Instead, we just listen in the national anthems for the drivers. Thanks God. We got we got in the last two years in the last years we got after a time that we didn't have more Italian drivers in the last years with um, Andrea Kimi Antonelli and Gabriele Mini we got Italian drivers with us so we will listen in the national anthems and it's also it's always a moment to be proud of it's always a moment that uh, is funny when we win a race and then uh, even the french of uh, portuguese engineers working with us we all sing in together the national anthems of italy is <laughs> something is something nice and something making that prema has it on their on their heart so it's something that um, i'm really i'm really proud of we are singing as well don't worry we are part of the same <laughs> same group <laughs> But but I want to talk a little bit more about links to Formula One briefly in terms of management because there's a very similar story happening at Alpine. Uh, Oliver Oakes went from the high tech GP Formula Two team, managing that entire unit, to managing Formula One. And I want to get your perspective on that. Firstly, you, you mentioned about how tricky it might be to jump with Prima to Formula One, but just from a management point of view, right? As as a team principal, what do you see as the step up? Because we often talk about driver development. But we never talk about team principal development. And Oliver Oaks is one of those interesting stories who's gone from F2 to F1 now. Ah, for sure. Oli and he's doing a great job. It's, I think the last podium they've done in uh, on the last weekend uh, has been in Brazil has been great uh, for all the people working in Alpine. Having said that, of course, in, in my position is... Uh, I would say it's a bit, uh, it's difficult to think about it because on the other hand, my dad has been the founder of Prema. So Prema is also my art. Prema is also my family. It's not only that I'm an employee of Prema, but um, I'm part of the, on the founder family and then all our life has been dedicated to Prema. So this is a bit different point of view. Uh, of course, even uh, Oli has been <clears throat> the founder into iTech, but the history behind all what my dad um did in these 41 years has been, uh, I think, if we are here, is of course credit to him of his vision, of his uh, continuing pushing. Even now, that is in, uh, that is retired, but he's continuing going into Formula Four races. He's continuing going into the on, into the Freca, trying to give tips to the young drivers, trying to help them to to achieve the best result as possible. So this is something that is absolutely. Uh, I, I would not be able to do anything if my dad would not be there because, of course, he's really, really a machine. He's really the engine behind everything. I will start. Of course, I'm I'm pushing forward as well. I'm I'm part. I'm, I'm following much more all the bigger project and uh, and the bigger categories. But uh, is uh, I think if we are here is of course thanks to him. But having said that, of, of course, it's a dream to be in Formula One. And of course, if the, the occasion will come up on the on the table, we need to discuss and we need to think about it. But my heart is still Prima. And then, of course, this is part of my of my life and my family. That's actually a beautiful tribute. And that's why when I say the passion is so evident, it was evident in that answer where, you know, you've, you've of course, doffed your hats off to what, you know, the work that your dad has put in to bring Prema to where it is today. And if we can just segue a bit into Formula 2, going deeper, because that is one of the premier series, uh, you know, which is getting very popular. Uh, you know, in, in Formula 1, teams get paid to go racing, right? And I love that at the start of uh, our conversation, you said uh, it's a business that Prema has to run and every step you take has to be a business and a data-driven decision. So how do teams in Formula 2 make money? If that's something you are able to explain to the audiences, then. So basically, there is uh, for us the contractors part is either the drivers, either the management of the drivers, either Formula One team that are supporting their drivers into their into their growing up. So most of the time, this is uh, the. Um, this is the business of Formula 2 and all the junior formula. So we are get paid to be racing. 
Of course, there's sometimes also the team will make some investment in the needs of certain drivers. But in general, we need to make sure that at the end of the year, when we close the balance sheet and the profit and loss is on positive. Because if we are losing money, of course, the company needs to put the money and you have a risk of uh, insolvency and all this kind of stuff. So the business is a normal business. Of course, in the past, in the cars, you will see sponsor, you will see everything, but it's more, some sponsor are team related. Some other sponsor are driver related. So the drivers try to um, get the budget that the team would require through sponsor, or also through family and funds. And uh, this is a bit how is the business on uh, on Formula Two. Of course, it will be ideal to get uh, money coming from uh, coming from the system. But already now, at the moment, we have to say that the promoter is really taking care that we are um, we are helped in uh, from the freight point of view, from the logistic point of view. We have certain help that is coming from. Uh, from Formula 2 and Formula 3 promoter, speaking especially about these two categories that can permit us to go racing abroad, to go racing in the Middle East, in Australia, in Azerbaijan, in, and in all the, in the flyaway race. So this is always need uh, to be a compromise. And that's a that's a great point because, you know, uh, I know when you look at Formula 1's balance sheets, there's actually a a price that the promoter pays to Formula One for licensing Formula Two and Formula Three as brands. So technically, Formula Two pays to be a part of the Formula One circus, which is understandable. That's how F1's business is built. But the interesting explanation you've given here is, uh, you know, how Formula Two has to balance between spends and performance. Because in a Formula One team, for example, if you crash something. Uh, you have to replace it with uh, with the best spec that's available because the more points, the better the ranking and the more you get paid. But in the case of Formula 2, if a driver breaks something, okay, there is a cost to replacing that part, which eventually comes either from your balance sheet or the driver's uh, own money or whoever is backing the drivers then. So how do you end up finding you know, a balance between business performance and then on-track performance? Because these are harsh uh, decisions to make. But this for sure. But in our case, we have uh, a certain uh, method and business method that can allow us in the case of crash, we need to change the parts because first of all, uh, we are racing for performance. And if you want to do this job, we know that to race in Formula in, in any category you're racing, from Formula 4 till Formula Regional, if you want to win, you need always to have the best material as possible. So you need to be able to, in your budget calculation, uh, you need to be able to spend maybe a bit more because you need to be sure that everything is, uh, you have always on top of the notch uh, quality material. And that is happening also, not also for crash, but if uh, if we notice that the performance of a break will uh, stay perfect on 100% of their performance for one race and after it degrade, you need to make sure that in your budget, in your calculation, prior the season, you know that when is the time to change, you have the capability to change. In, instead, sometimes that's most in the junior junior category teams trying to uh, do uh, to make a result try to do something and then they cut a bit on the budget make sure that it's possible to run but then you when you do a lower budget category uh, or a lower budget uh, signature on the contract with the drivers what will happen that if you don't have the money then you cannot change part and this is part is fundamental if you want to keep performance high and on the topic of performance in Formula 2, there's it, there's so many things going around, right? There's so many weird scenarios where drivers who are not really very high in F2 are getting to Formula 1. Like one of your own drivers, Oliver Behrman, very capable in what he's done in Formula 1. And I, I'm just so confused about where F2 is today. Where is F2 today, Rene? Do you think it works as a feeder series? Because there are so many drivers like Behrman, like Lawson, like Logan Sargent, like Jack Doohan, who haven't won championships in F2 and haven't gotten outstanding so, results, but have gotten to F1. So is, the, is it working still, the championship? So first of all, I have to say, uh, winning in Formula 2 is very difficult. It's, uh, it's, not, only, it's not only the fact that uh, the type of racing that is difficult, but of course, uh, um, the fact that you have uh, from the pit stop, the, 
the not much track time you have available or you enter in free practice you have one or two run when you can do performance then of course the tires are gone then you enter straight away in quality with a different spec of tires this is of course this is something that helping you to grow up as fast as possible if you look uh, if i look at both drivers that i have this year of course they're struggling sometimes but there is also sometimes some other reason how to power control that happened can be a red flag can be a situation that can compromise the quality you compromise the quality you don't do anything else in the races because it's um the race are quite quite tight so it's very difficult you don't just start last and win unless you got something like happened with gabriel bortoletto in monza that you got a safety car and so on that can reshuffle everything uh, credit to him he did a, gra- a great race not uh, against him but of course this uh, the safety car in monza helped him a lot but apart saying that Oli, i think is ready to formula one Rodi, uh, Oli already last year showed to the people what he's capable of doing of course this year there's been some up and down but uh, we must say it's, uh, it's something that credit to both the drivers both Oli and kimi we are still fighting for the podium in the championship which is uh, everybody forget it but we are before in the championship now and then we can fight for top three on the championship and uh, honestly we are still for and uh, with andrea kimi we can fight in the last two rounds to be on the top three of the championship on the drivers so the performance of both drivers i think has been uh good we have to say Oli birman in jeddah did pole position mm-hmm. He won a great race um, in um, in Monza. He did uh, the other race win that was quite difficult. That was in uh, in Spielberg. So honestly, we is is really ready to Formula One, and I think that Formula One results show him. But sometimes the result in Formula Two is not just drivers, it's not just team. is a is a mix of is a mix of factor that it can happen because we are in a championship that we have 22 cars all the same, and sometimes some problems happen. But uh, I would say everything at the end uh, is uh, if I look the last drivers coming to Formula One. I think all the drivers that are passed through Formula Two, they are they're doing a great job, and because Formula Two is for is uh, is in, as an important path into the driver's ladder. So, the teams, the Formula One teams, are looking more at the performance rather than the results. Is what we're sort of. Like the ah, way I the think for sure, that, but for sure, the Formula One team are looking on performance. Not all, not always. You look at the because the race uh, result is sometimes affected by accident by mistakes, which are normal, I would say, in, in the learning process. It's better to have an accident in junior formula than when it's time of Formula One. So, of course, for us, we want mm. to win as a team. We want to do the best job as possible. I think we need to address certain point of performance after this year in Formula Two with us. But uh, still, it's, uh, it's, uh, we still have two rounds to go and uh, we can still do a great job having the drivers fighting for win. And, and everything. On the other hand, all the time when we say, uh, when I speak with drivers that in any category we do, I say to them, listen, we need all the time trying to do our best, both in quality and the races. We cannot think since day one on championship. We start in thinking of the championship on the on the round one. We will start in losing our focus. In the, the goal is to do all the time the best result as possible. Is the best result being P3, P4, P5? We need to take home P3, P2, P4, P5. At the end of the championship, we will judge if we have done a good job or a bad job. Because at the end of the championship, we can evaluate where we are, how we arrived. And this is, for me, very, very, very important. We should not just look in on day one, ah, but we have to go for the championship. The championship is a mix of factors that sometimes is out of our control. Mm-hmm. And in all the sports, because, of course, you have uh, external factor. You got a red flag that you are on the pole lap and the, and the time has been, uh, has been stopped. You don't start anymore in pole, you start in P10. But on your potential, on your belt, you have P1 lap. So this is part of motorsport and this part of the championship. And then you need to live with that. You mentioned I just make an example. I just make yeah, an yeah. example. No, but, but you mentioned something so interesting there, uh, performance. And I'm so curious to know how you measure performance. Because so many of the drivers racing for Prema are normally with the Driver Academy. Like Oscar was with Alpine. Kimi is with Mercedes and so on and so forth. What sort of data do you share with them and how involved are those academies on a day-to-day basis? How much do they speak to you? What do they sort of 
get inputs on? I'd love to know more about the whole process. So depends from academy to academy. Not all the academy are the same. Some some academy are leaving the team dealing with the drivers in, in 360 degrees. Some other academy indeed are more uh, into the growing up of the drivers, even on the technical side. Depends a bit on their mentality and their way of working. On the other hand, we have a great relationship with all the academy we work with. Um, when they ask information, we share information. But of course, what they ask us is to prepare the drivers. So they let us do in our job and to they ask our suggestion in the way we want to grow up at drivers. And of course, we have a plan at the beginning of the year. And from there, we move forward. This is, uh, but we are doing our job that the drivers is into an academy or the driver is not into the academy, but it's a private drivers. We are doing the same job because we want to give the drivers all the same chance to win in and all the same chance to perform. Of course, if the driver is within an academy, he has an extra support for them. But then is mo- most of the time at the moment now is more into the mental and physical side. On the mm-hmm. technical side, some academy are working, some other not. But this is uh, a bit on the, um, on the global pictures vision that each Formula One team is doing. I, I love the depth that's coming in into this. And I'm going to, uh, talking of driver performance, and you've explained there are race interruptions, session interruptions, etc. The The key question I wanted to sort of get in on was how equal are these machines in Formula 2? Because Fernando Alonso, when he was asked about motorsport in the Olympics, he said you get all the machines made from the same factory. They will never be exactly the same because there is a machine involvement. How equal is the machinery in Formula 2? And, you know, how do the organizers, in this case, uh, the promoters, ensure equal equality of machinery? So in terms of parts, to be honest, I don't see uh, discrepancy in performance. Car, chassis, through the years, we changed quite a lot of cars. We changed quite a lot of chassis, either for accident, either for life in, either for whatever reason. We sell a car to a previous driver because he wants to have his own car as memoralia. Then, of course, we need to buy a new car. We never had really issue, especially nowadays, in the modern days, all the machinery stuff, all the carbon qualities are really high, high standard. So I don't see. The only performance difference can be related to gearbox efficiency and engine. But on this case, Federation and promoter are putting very, very strict windows. And um, that um, that at the end, yes, there could be some difference, but you can also not notice. Sometimes, of course, is it just a fact that if you have bad luck and you get a bad engine that is on the lower side of the windows, you can struggle in a bit. But uh, discussing together with promoter and CERN, I think you always find a way to uh, sort it out. It might be a bit tricky for a young driver, right? If you've spent so much to get to Formula 2 and then an unlucky engine comes in. As a team, how do you, how can you support them knowing that there's not much that can be done apart from waiting for the right engine? If that but does uh, Honestly, it never happened in the last years. So mm. I, I must say, Promoter is doing a great job on that. And we have always uh, quite an equal treatment between uh, between all the parts that we are receiving. There is a close check by FIA on it. And then honestly, this is very, very important because we guarantee to drivers to get uh, a, something that uh, is, um, is equal and permit them to perform in the best way as possible. You know, it's so cool. And I want to now loop this chat back onto how you nurture drivers. Because drivers to me are like plants, right? You give a plant air, water and sunlight and they grow. What do you need to give a driver for them to grow? What, what do you have as your playbook of growing up and creating a good racing driver? But the, first of all, uh, the, what you give to drivers is different from one category to another. When the driver started in Formula 4, you need to give the knowledge of basic of driving, the knowledge of uh, even behavior. Is it like a school that you're giving? You pass in the same information, but on, on different level of details. You don't give to an elementary school kid the same information of uh, science and biology that you give to the university people. Because that even if the subject at the end is the same and everything is exactly the same matter, but the level of details, the level of information, the level of data behind is totally different. And it's the same in motorsport. You starting from a driver's incoming Formula 4 or in karting that you teach them the ABC, teach them how to write. When you arrive in Formula 2 or in, a, in, the, in the higher category, you teach them how to write faster, quicker. And, but at the end, it's, it's, the same, uh, it's the same ABC. So this is uh, something very important. And even the level of engineer, when you are in Formula 4, your engineer is younger. Your engineer is less experienced. 
and in Formula 2, you have more people because our team is also a ladder, as also a school for mechanics and engineers. So this is also the, the way of working behind. I like that uh, the ladder is for everyone in Prema and not just the drivers. And yeah. uh, talking of young drivers, you know, I think Formula 1 seeing the the young driver, the Franco Colap into effect, as I call it, because he's come in in Williams, he's done wonders. And suddenly everyone's like, we want Lawson and we want Antonelli and we want Bortoletto. Why do you think young drivers are so ready for Formula 1 these days? And when I say these days, if you just go back a few years with Mazepin and Schumacher, which was not too long ago, it was largely believed they needed more time to settle in. Okay, But suddenly now, you know, F1 teams are ditching experience for younger drivers. So is it Formula 2 or even stuff they do outside of Formula 2 with the academies that's preparing them so well for Formula 1? No, I think, first of all, uh, drivers like Mick was ready for Formula 1, like other drivers, uh, on, even before. Uh, there is not this uh, this driver in the moment. It's just a question of generation, just a question of moment. At, at, at today, there were the need of new drivers in Formula 1 because it is open some spots into Formula 1. So... There's been some uh, some discussion, is the ladder working or not? Uh, not all the time you have space for two, three, four drivers coming from Formula 2. There is years that you don't have drivers coming to Formula 1, but not because they're not ready, but just because there is no space. In Formula 1, you have long-standing contract with drivers. You have drivers that are still on the... I can say in the middle of their of their career, you don't stop them because you have a drivers in Formula Two. So this is why it's important also to have all the collateral program that you can give to drivers to make them somehow parking for one year, getting ready, getting prepared, and then moving forward. There is not actually that the drivers are more prepared now and uh, than before. For sure now. What I can say, Formula 2 and Formula 3 team has invested quite a lot in technology as well. So the use of simulator, the use of uh, these uh, uh, equipment is quite become common. Things that in the past, the, the simulator was just on Formula 1. But apart from that, this is something that makes the difference also why we are in Formula 2, why teams like Prema or like other teams fighting for the championship are preparing drivers better than than uh, than others. So this is a part of our of our growing as well as a team, as a structures. You know, uh, I, I'll tell you the big solution needed here is the 11th team in Formula 1 called Prema Power Team. Power team, Pema Racing. We anyway have a lovely connect with uh, Hindi, as as Samil mentioned at the start of the conversation. But just to pick your uh, brains further on driver development, uh, you know, when do you know a driver is ready for Formula One? Like, what are the metrics you sort of look at? Well, first of all, a driver is ready to Formula One is a driver that uh, in the closer stage of Formula One of the ladder, so Formula Two, Formula Three. Driver capable of winning races. Drivers capable of on keeping the pressure in the difficult moment. Drivers capable that uh, when is understanding that when is the time to take home the P3, he take home the P3. When is time to try to overtake for P1 because he has potential to attract the P1, but it's not too risky. He will go for it. And... Um, these are the characteristics, of course, also on the technical side, being able to guide an engineer, being able to guide a team. These are the clear facts that can say a driver is ready or not. And who do you bring into the team? I would just want to get basic insights on the whole program. Imagine if you're a young driver coming up, if you're, let's say, 18 or 19, starting out your racing journey. Just what, what's, what's the limit like for you guys? When do you say, okay, this is probably you're a bit too old to get to the Prima Ladder now, maybe... Maybe if you're 20, is it too late? Or what's the sort of cap that you put on drivers getting but to Formula the, 3? We don't put limitation on it. Of course, no? at the moment, in driving in Formula 4 are starting 15. So they mm. you start knowing them at 14. Honestly, if you start Formula 4, 18, 19, it's a bit too late. But of course, that depends, of course, on the country where you're coming from, the, mm. the environment where you're coming from. Everything is open at the moment, but how this the structures is made, I think you need to be in Formula 4 when it's 15, 16. Already, if you are in 16, it's not a problem. Even if for somebody it's too late, but because there is people are getting crazy, they want to be in Formula in Formula 4 when they're already starting at 14. It's not possible. Regulations stick with 15. We are sticking into the FIA rules to make sure that you cannot test before 14 and, um, and half. And having said that, and just racing when you are 15, uh, but I think uh, 
you can even increase a bit the age at the moment, I think, personally. I think if you start racing at 16, because at the end you arrive in Formula 2, you are 18, 19, and it's still young. So you can extend that a bit because uh, otherwise you need to understand how many years after you need maybe to wait and so on to go to Formula 1. And that is a bit uh, the tricky point. Hmm. Makes sense. And one driver who's totally broken the system in that way is Kimi Antonelli, to the point that the FI had to make a minor rule change to get him in. And he's, of course, a product of the Prema Academy. And I, I really want to understand more about him as a driver from you, because you've seen such a critical part of his journey. And what's been the biggest area of improvement, according to you, in Kimi? Where, where do you see him growing so much in the last couple of years, particularly? Of course, first of all, between all the drivers passing to Prema, there is not a way to make any difference or any comparison. Each year is different. Each year has his own story. Each year has his own good moment, a bad moment. Kimi has been in part in our team in the last three, three and a half years. He started three and a half years ago in Formula 4 with Sam Round and he's been one, he's one of the most promising Italian kids coming out from the um, Formula 4 and Formula Regional um, settings and, uh, and ladder. Jumping straight away, jumping from Formula Regional into Formula Two, and to be honest, uh, a part of the first round when I would say performance was affected by us more than for the drivers. From round two, it was always I would say in top three row on quali, which is something absolutely incredible. He, he master win in Silverstone under the wet. He, he has done great, great results um, overall. So I think he won in Ungaroring. Uh, I think that honestly is um, how can I say is is doing a great job. Is uh, is a great talent. Is road now is already decided to move into Formula One next year. He still have to learn a lot. He's still young, but he has all the potential to do a very good job. With us, he did something incredible. He won Formula Four. He won Formula Regional. Uh, he he been part of us in all the junior formula. He stepped with us in Formula Two, a lot of pressure from outside, but he managed pretty well. When we are together, we're always trying to do on our job, not considering what has been told outside. Even through the season has been quite difficult with all the rumors stepping up, 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 no, back, mm -hmm. and so on. But on the other hand, he managed pretty well. We manage, I think, pretty well in a difficult in a difficult moment in terms of pressure. But uh, but we need to again look in race by race, doing our best job as possible, and uh, and that's where we are now. What was Mercedes's brief when they got Kimi Antonelli? What did they tell you? What do we want from this guy? What what do you do with him now? What is uh, Mercedes following like? Kimi since the karting years. They always trust him a lot. They always supporting him a lot. And then uh, when he came out, the moment to step into Formula Four, we got a, I, I got him a call, a text by the young drivers manager Gwen. La group. La group, and then yeah. yeah, and we starting and we starting discussing about Kimi, but it was quite an automatic fit. An Italian drivers, an Italian team working with Mercedes, I think, was something automatically. And then and from there we start on. Um, to be to be honest, we didn't have much Italian drivers in the last years, and I'm pretty happy that uh, on the last two years we got with Andrea and uh, and with Gabriele we got two Italian talent because we need to be a bit also close to our nation and the, these two young kids is something very very important yes that Italian passion that we've been talking of uh, for the last uh, almost an hour now but what's the one piece of advice you would give to Toto Wolff for managing Kimi Antonelli in 2025 I don't have to say anything. <laughs> Toto is very well experienced to manage young drivers. He has done uh, with a lot of drivers in the past. Uh, and for sure, I will do this, the best to Kimi. Kimi, I think, is uh, around him. He has a great, a, a great group of people that will uh, manage him in the best way as possible. And I'm sure that all the results will come in, um, in a very short time. Of course, he needs to have a bit of time to grow in up. He's still very young. He just turned 18. And in August, and uh, but he has a great future ahead of him, and I'm pretty sure he will uh, he will bring uh, the the Italian flag on top on the podium, even on Formula One, quite soon. Yes, you and all of us will get to enjoy that Italian anthem pretty soon, <laughs> I hope. But you know, when you first got that call from Gwen saying, "Hey, I'm going to put Andrea Kimi from Freca to Formula Two," did you at any point think? My God, they're crazy! Or did you think it was a prank call? Like, how did you handle the, that? Of course, is it was a talk that we we had, and on the other hand, I understand their point, understand their their uh, their point of view. 
Of course, you can agree, you cannot, and you can disagree. This is uh, something personal that is related between uh, between the two things. But at the end, we made this choice. We agree on this choice because when we signed the agreement, we were in agreement. I could have even say no, but I say no. Okay, let's go for it. And uh, we're just trying to give as much of information to Kimi as possible, just to give him all the knowledge as quickly as possible to to step up in Formula Two. The step from Freca to Formula Two is massive. And uh, is, is, I would say, difficult, but uh, is achieving pretty well. And then uh, I'm really proud of all the job that all the team has done together with him. I mean, that, that video is very interesting where any session you pick, he knows the lap time. So you guys have really <laughs> fed him a lot of information, which he stored no, there. But this, uh, this honestly is something that he's all, is, he remembers everything. He knows everything. Wow. Uh, you can ask him everything about uh, racing. Uh, the thing is, just a funny anecdote. Is, uh, we, I was racing in Le Mans. It was 2000, um, 2022. Uh, we were uh, there in the race, uh, fighting for the win of class in LMP2 with Robert Kubica and Luis De Letras. And then at a certain point, uh, I received a text over the weekend and he say, I'm here in Le Mans, René. I say, what? <laughs> Sorry, what you are doing here? So he traveled alone, coming to Le Mans to see the race. And he's really a, guy, a, a kid that is eating, as we say in Italian, bread and motorsport. He, he is really loving what he's doing. He's living, loving. He's really loving what's everything related to motorsport, every type of car, driving, always on track, and so on. And this is great, great passion for him. So honestly, um, is is uh, a fantastic guy to work with, like a lot of other drivers that we that we have been working together. But him is uh, is something particular. Oh yeah, there I am. Two, four years of COVID, and then. I've forgotten how to unmute my mic. But like Oliver Behrman, uh, who's also gone through your academy and who's also now come up to Formula 1. He's already got, what, three GP appearances? And we know a bit about him. But you've seen him far more than all of us have. What should we be excited about the most? What's the best so, part about First Behrman of all, all he didn't do with us all the, all the growing. He jumped to us into Formula 3 directly after winning Formula 4 against us. So we fight. <laughs> uh, we were, we were, we, he beat us one, uh, in that year where we got um, Sebastian Montoya with us, uh, fighting for the championship in Formula 4. He stepped up in Formula 3 and directly at the end of the championship, he was fighting in the last race. Uh, if the race would not be in red flag... Uh, I would say he would have been champion. So mm. at the beginning, we were agreed with him to do another season in Formula 3. But after the race being red flag, on the other hand, we could not do anything else than say to him, OK, let's step up in Formula 2, because you would have been champion if two, two three more laps would have been happened. So, And it was, even for him, quite a fast growing from Formula 4 till Formula 3, and then uh, straight after in Formula 2, and automatically, uh, I would say, he was always being competitive. He did a master weekend in Baku on, uh, on that year, on, uh, on, on his debut in Formula 2. Everybody remember, and honestly, he, he growing up with us uh, on the second year, of course, there's been some good moment and bad moment. He has done some good wins in the race. Uh, and then, of course, uh, this is, uh, and now is uh, going into Formula One together with us, and, and I'm looking forward to see him fighting again for more points in the Formula One Championship. Yeah, and you know, Behrman's already made a great step in qualifying. I think the last three qualifying sessions, he's gone quicker than Nico Hulkenberg, who yep. himself has you know been a qualifying specialist. But if we also, you know, given the list of drivers that were there, and we, we'll, you know, we should wrap up in the next five odd minutes, uh, Rene, if that's okay. And uh, talking of Oscar Piastri, you know, the one question that's always been on our minds is, has his performance been a surprise to you? He's literally taken to Formula One in a way as though he's been a veteran in the series, you know, and did you always see the speed in, in him and the strengths in him in, in Formula Two? But honestly, his uh, Formula Two season, his Formula Three season has been absolutely outstanding. Uh, everybody can say he was not fast in Formula 3, guys. It uh, was a COVID year, difficulties. We'd, uh, we'd just done a testing in Bahrain, then everything shut down from, I don't know, many months. We restarted in, in uh, end of June, beginning of July, with all back-to-back -back races where you don't even have time to process, where you don't even have time to understand what's going on on yourself. And uh, circuit that he didn't know, he, we were racing in Mugello that he didn't know Mugello. He got in the first part of the season uh, a problem that nobody were able to solve on, on the DRS. 
because it was linked to a glitch on the electronic system. Honestly, is uh, then it step into Formula Two a season again strange because uh, the only season with eight round three ra- three races per round. But since the moment we turn in Silverstone, that lapping quality that he did in Silverstone, the pole position again in Monza, the pole position again in Sochi and Abu Dhabi was something outstanding. And um, what he's doing now is not surprising me at all. What I like of him is his um, calm, his relaxed way of approaching. When you see outside, you don't see that he's a racing driver, but when he put his helmet, he's a machine. And that's, uh, I'm sure that this will bring him very, very far away in Formula 1. To talk about another F2 champion who I personally wanted to see thrive in Formula 1, we touched about him just a few minutes earlier as well, was Mick Schumacher. I was hoping he gets an Audi seat or a second shot to Formula 1. I personally think his career wasn't the best managed the two years he was with Haas for various reasons. Why do you think Mick did not thrive in Formula 1 when he had those two years then? Uh, of course, Formula One is not uh, differently from uh, other category where you expect series, and more or less, uh, it's just the difference on the team who can make the difference. In Formula One, you have a car that can be much more faster than anybody. It depends on the budget you are available. It depends on various aspects. Of course, on the year of Mick, us were not the best car on the field. It's not the same car as is now, and this, of course, can affect the driver's point of view because, and then especially some few crashes that uh, that happened that year can make a bit of difference. Uh, I would say, with us, Mick did a great job. He jumped into Formula Three. He won Formula Three. He was P2 in Formula Four um, after missing few races because we decided to concentrate more in the German Championship. We we won Formula Two again. So I cannot say anything about him. It's really, really one. He's a great talent. He's a great person. He's bringing with him a great name, which sometimes can be also weight, but uh, he's always managed it. And now he's doing a very great job in endurance. There was also also this perception that Mick is a slow learner. He needs more time. He took three, two years to win F3, two years to win F2. Is that really? I mean, you've worked so closely with him. Is that the right perception that the world has of him? To be honest, I don't. I don't want to say he's a low, he's a low, slow learner. There's, uh, there's been drivers that has been uh, maturing in a championship in a year one. There's drivers maturing in the championship on year two. Is uh, there has been drivers maturing in the championship on year three. So to be honest, it's not. Uh, it's not surprising me, and it's not making any anything any things negative against him. If he's mature and he's ready, and he won on year two, he's still a, a good driver capable of going to Formula One. Yeah, that's interesting. And last question from me. Two of my very close drivers, Dennis Hauger and Jehan Daruwala, teammates with you at Prema. Where, how, how do you think their campaign went in Formula 2? Was there something lacking? Because, of course, they, did not, they, they didn't make the list of drivers who get promoted to Formula 1 after a Prema drive. Uh, to be honest, uh, that year was a bit uh, would have been strange. 2022, we got the race with us in 2022. Uh, starting from Jan, he was fighting for the championship. If you consider, he, he got disqualified for a team mistakes in Spielberg. Uh, yeah. With with that point, he would be on top tier of the championship. And uh, we know Jan since the Formula Three times when he was racing with Carlin in 2017 that he moved with us. In uh, in 2019, uh, um, in 2019, and he arrived P3 in the championship in Formula Three, fighting against Robert Robert Schwarzman, who won the championship, and Marcus Armstrong that uh, passed him on P2 on the last round in Sochi. And but he's another driver that has great potential and 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 his great performance. So of course, it's all is the moment where you are racing that sometimes can bring you to Formula 1 or not to Formula 1. Dennis as well did a great season in Formula 3 with us. And uh, after that, he, he moved to Formula 2. There's been some good moments, bad moments, but he did wins and podiums. And then, of course, he, then he, for various reasons, he, we split away on the year after he moved to another team and the results were not where uh, he wanted to be. But he's another driver that can... Uh, can do a great job maybe not to formula one because again there is no place for everybody in formula one but uh, for sure he can have a future in all the categories in uh, in motorsport that you can have there is not only formula one we must remember and going into formula one there is always a, a mix of factors not only performance but always moment situation 
uh, various aspects that are that need to combine together. And last question for the day today, Rene. I want to know a few drivers who we are going to discuss the next time we chat. Any young talents coming through the roster? Who who should we keep an eye on? Not just in Formula Two, but also Freca F3. Any drivers who you like the taste of so far? Uh, there is. Uh, listen, all the drivers with Prema, I hope that they will do a good uh, a good history. <laughs> there is not one I want to pick up, of course, because it will be unfair for me. Because when I choose the drivers, I I always trust that everybody can do a good job. So I think next time we'll see, we will talk about other drivers. And I'm sure that Prema will bring again drivers into Formula 1 in the coming years. Uh, sounds fun. But it was amazing to have you on, Rene. So great to hear the stories of how the team came about, how you actually run the ship, what F2 is like, and also about the drivers moving up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to all.